Uh, just a little bit about me and then we'll get into the presentation. Uh, I'm a licensed psychologist and I have been for about 25 years now. Um, I started off working in a community mental health center way back in the early 1980s where basically I was the jack of all trades. I, anybody who came through the door, I saw it. Didn't matter if they were kids, adolescents, adults, I saw them. And so I got a lot of good practical experience working in that, um, in that environment. I've also had the opportunity to work in psychiatric hospitals with very challenging patients as well as private practice. I was in full-time private practice in Green Bay, Wisconsin for six years uh, before we moved down here where I took on a job at MTSU where I currently teach and have been for, this is my 21st year, uh, in the professional counseling program. Throughout this whole time period, I've maintained an active uh, private, part-time private practice and most of what I do are psychological evaluations for people who are suspected of having attention deficit disorder. Uh, whether that's kids who are at least eight years old, adolescents, or it's really interesting, over the past five or six years, I've actually had more adults coming in for these evaluations than I have kids, which is really interesting because um, nowadays we know that that ADHD just doesn't stop. You just don't outgrow this. In 50% of the cases, people continue with this into adulthood, although it changes. It looks different. But um, so that's my background. That's what I do. And uh, what I thought I'd do tonight is talk a little bit about um, attention deficit disorder. These are the things that I want to talk about up here. But uh, more specifically, what I'd like uh, for you folks to take out of this uh, presentation tonight uh, is first of all just to kind of understand what is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. We'll talk about how psychologists go about diagnosing uh, this condition and finally we'll talk about well how is this treated, how is it managed, and hopefully we'll have a little bit of time for uh, questions and answers <clears throat> at the end. And while I'm going through my presentation, I, I have a lot to present, but please feel free to ask questions as I go along. I just don't want to stand up here and, and do my spiel. I do have a lot of information, but please feel free to stop, ask a question. Chances are, if you have a question, somebody else out there probably has the same question, so don't hesitate to stop me as, as we go along uh, tonight, okay? So I think a good place to start is with this question right here, what is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder? And I think that if you just kind of look at that name, it sort of says in and of itself what it is, but I want to talk about kind of more of its history, how it came about. Many years ago, there was a guy in this field who's done tons of research by the name of Russell Barkley. He's, he's written a lot of textbooks or just books about this books for uh, the general population as well as for practitioners like me. And one of the things that I thought was kind of amusing when I first uh, read uh, one of his books is he was talking about attention deficit disorder and some of the characteristics. And he talked about what he had called the holy trinity of ADHD symptoms, which I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. You know, so let's read a little bit more about this. So in this uh, description, uh, what he first talked about was this element of hyperactivity. Of course, that's in the actual title of the diagnosis. And by the way, I want to remind you, if you're following along with your, um, with your handouts, there is a handout for the PowerPoint slides, if you want to take that out. What you'll notice in those handouts for the PowerPoint slides is as you look at the slides, you'll see blanks in each of those slides every now and then. That's for you to fill in. That's for you to be more of an active learner in what we're doing tonight. So you don't have to fill those in if you don't want, but if you are following along and you see that and you thought, what the heck are those blanks in there for? That's for you to fill in as I talk about these things, okay? So if you think back to when you guys, many of you were in elementary school, and you can kind of think back to classmates who were in constant motion. They were always out of their seats, doing something, whether it was going to the pencil sharpener, uh, whether it was to throw something away, asking the teacher, can I go to the bathroom? I really need to go. 
And whatever the case was, they were just kind of in constant motion. They may have been talking a lot or, or whatnot. So any excuse that they had that they could get up and move around, that's what they tried to do. So excessive motion is what we're talking about uh, here, and that's what's characteristic, at least one of the features of one of its types of attention deficit disorder. There are different types of this disorder, by the way. Impulsivity is another one of those holy trinity symptoms of attention deficit disorder. And it's really not uncommon for kids, or adults even for that matter, not to give second thought to what comes out of their mouth. And I always have loved this Dennis the Menace uh, cartoon. It's not popular anymore, but this really gets to the point. If you see what's happening to Dennis here, he's, he's essentially in timeout. He's in a corner facing the wall. By the time I think about what I'm going to do, I already did it, which is perfect. It's a perfect description of many kids who have attention deficit with that impulse control problem. And so you might have a child who um, sees a classmate coming in. Jessica is her name. And she says to Je Jessica, oh, I really love your hair today, Jessica, but that dress really makes you look fat. And it's like Jessica's thinking, what? You know, so it's these types of things that come out of the mouth, and there's no, there's no filtering, but there might not even be awareness that they're coming off this way to other kids. And then they wonder later on, why doesn't Jessica want to hang out, out with me at recess? So it's, it's this type of thing that, that happens as well. And then finally, as part of that holy trinity of symptoms is uh, inattention. So as the name implies, kids have difficulty paying attention. For, for very long. And so this especially happens, and you may notice this too, if you have kids who have ADHD or who you suspect have it, that when they're doing something that's boring or monotonous, that's when you really see the problems. It's not when they're playing video games or doing something that they like, which is what we're gonna be talking about later. It's when they're doing something that they really don't have interest in. So the types of things that you would see in the classroom or the types of things that you would hear are, Adam, pay attention, right? Adam, get back to work, right? Adam, turn around and do your work. I mean, these are the types of things that you hear because they're just kind of off in, in space doing their own thing, okay? In your handout, the very top of the hand of the one that shows a picture of my website with a lady on a computer monitor. If you turn that over, turn that one over, the very top one, on the back side where it says DSM-5, what you'll see listed there are the criteria for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder that are listed in something called the Diagnostic and Statistical <coughs> Manual, which is just a fancy way of saying the Bible of <coughs> mental disorders. It has all the list of mental disorders, all the descriptions, including attention deficit disorder. If you look at that, you'll notice that there are two broad categories. You'll see the inattention category first, and notice how <coughs> under that, that there are uh, a list of symptoms. There are nine of them, to be exact. And if you look under hyperactivity and impulsivity, the same thing. There are a list of symptoms, Nine of them are there as well. So what happens here is that to meet the criteria for attention deficit disorder, you have to show at least uh, six of these symptoms if you're a child, if you're at least 16 or under, or up to 16. If you're 17 or over, there have to be at least five of these symptoms that you display to be diagnosed with the disorder. And so what happens is that some people have a lot of symptoms that are in the inattention category, some that are just in the hyperactivity impulsivity category, and a lot of people have them actually that are in both categories. But these are the types of things that psychologists like myself will look at when we're talking to people who are suspected of having this disorder, that we'll look at these features first. And in fact, what ends up happening is that a lot of times I have parents come in 
or I'll have <coughs> adults come in who want to be evaluated that have already done this part. They've already gotten on the internet and have done their research. And so it, it, in a sense, it almost makes it easy for me because they've kind of gone through and they say, yep, 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 that's me, 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 right there. So it kind of makes my job a little bit easier that way. But we don't stop with that because there are a lot of other things that go into the process of diagnosis, which we'll talk about in a little while, okay? Okay, so if you look at the statistics about how many people have attention deficit disorder, it's anywhere from about 5 to 8 percent. It depends on which st uh, statistics that you look at. But anywhere in there uh, is for, for kids and adolescents in the United States are diagnosed with this condition. And although the, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual says that a person has to display these symptoms prior to the age of 12, that doesn't always happen. In my clinical experience, what I've actually found is that some people aren't truly aware that they have this condition until they're in adulthood. I have people as adults that are coming into me. I, I think the oldest person I've had was uh, 68 years old who came in and said, you know what, I've had these things all my life. I never really knew what it was, but I think this might be going on. And lo and behold, yeah, that's what was going on. It's just amazing. So for some people, they don't really understand or are aware of this until a little bit later. Marilyn. Dr. Porto, what I was saying earlier as I was reading that book about my son who was a teenager. Yes. And looking at, I would see things about my husband. He was at 55. There you go. I would give it to him and he would say, this is me. And it was like this revelation. It's like, there's nothing. Things are not wrong with me. This is who I am. Exactly. And, and that book that you mentioned, Marilyn, by Ned Hallowell, that was really the, the book that came out that really made it possible for adults to understand an adult version <coughs> of, of this disorder, where nothing really had been written prior to that time. So that was really a remarkable book that, that came out at that time. Okay. So, you know, a lot of times you won't see kids show this, show these types of symptoms until a little later. Some kids will fly under the radar, especially the kids who have just the inattentive type of this disorder, where they're just kind of spacey, they're just kind of keeping to themselves, they're not disruptive, they're not causing problems in the classroom, so they kind of fly under the radar and they're not noticed until later on when things become more complex, especially starting in about middle school in high school when they are expected to do things much more independently. I mean, the independent stuff comes in third and fourth grade, but at that point in middle school, they're having a lot of teachers, they're expected to be independent, organized, self-sufficient, all these things where those are difficult for them, as we'll see a little later when we talk about something that are called executive functions. So I think that the, the issue for the middle schoolers and, and above are the whole issue of how do, I, how do I manage all the things that I'm expected to do, homework, chores, managing my social relationships, all the stuff that I have to do. And, and these are the things that you see them struggling with as they uh, get a little bit older. Now here's the interesting thing. And this is, a, this is an interesting question right here, is that doesn't everybody have a little bit of attention deficit disorder? Did you ever think about that? I mean, if you think about yourself, you know, you're watching TV, you're reading a book, you're working on the computer, whatever the case is, and all of a sudden your mind just kind of starts to take a little vacation, just starts to kind of take, take a detour. <laughs> yeah, and, and it happens, and this happens, and then you catch yourself, and you think to yourself, oh, wh what am I doing here? I'm, I, I need to be watching this movie, or I need to be reading this book, or I need to be working on the computer, whatever it is that you're doing, and you have enough self-awareness where you can catch yourself and go back and shift back to what you were doing, but that's not as easy for kids with attention deficit from a self-awareness standpoint or to make the mental shift back to something that they're supposed to be uh, doing. So, 
But I think that it does happen to all of us from time to time. And I think that when I was preparing for this presentation, I noticed that I was kind of squirming around in my chair. I was getting up. I was kind of moving around and doing this kind of stuff. It doesn't mean I have attention deficit disorder. We all do this kind of stuff, okay? So I think that if you look at this in relation to what's called the bell-shaped curve, some of you may have seen this thing before. And basically, this is just a graph that depicts different types of things about people and where they fall in relation to how intelligent they are, how well they can pay attention, or how tall a person is, and so on and so forth. And so let's say that I went out uh, on school side lane here, and at the end of the school day, and I were to, to select 100 kids randomly, I said, hey, you want to take an, an IQ test? Sure, I'll take it. And I test 100 kids. What I would probably find is that most of the kids that I test are probably going to be in the average range, and that's typically where most people are. And if I were to kind of graph that, uh, 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 put this depicted on this little graph here, most of the kids would, would kind of score right in this middle range, right? And that's kind of like the, the absolute average range right there. Some kids would score really high. Not many of them, but some of them would. Some of them would score a lot lower. Once again, not many of them, but some of them would. But most people would score right around in here. Okay, so that's what this bell-shaped curve is. So if you consider a person's attention span or their activity level, most people are able to pay attention fairly well. They have a moderate level of activity. It's nothing out of the ordinary. Most of us are going to score would score right in this mid-range in terms of attention and activity level. But you probably know people, whether it's yourself or a child, who is extremely active, where they would almost fall off the charts active-wise. And you probably also know people that are extremely inattentive, that they would go over here, they just can't pay attention very well. And this is what we're trying to look for when we uh, look for kids who might have attention deficit disorder. Do they kind of fall to the extremes? Do they kind of go beyond the norm to an extent where it's causing them problems, either in school, which is the main thing for you guys who have kids in school? Is it causing problems for them in relationships? Or is it causing problems for them personally, in their, in their families, this, this way? Okay. So those are all the things that we take into consideration that's related to this. Okay, so we don't pay attention 100% of the time, but nobody does. But we're looking for those people who kind of fall out into those extreme ranges there. So here's the thing about this. When we look for the possibility of attention deficit disorder, we're looking for people, we're, we're looking for, we're looking at the nature of the problem. We're looking at the frequency, how often it happens. How severe is it, which is kind of getting back to what I was just talking about with that bell-shaped curve, and how long have these symptoms been going on, okay? So if the symptoms are very characteristic of attention deficit, like we were talking about before when I had you look at that list of symptoms, if they're happening fairly frequently, if they're severe enough to be causing problems for the child in school, they're not achieving as well as we would expect them to, if it's causing problems in the relationship or in their job performance, if it's, if it's the case of an adult. If we're looking at all these areas, that's a cause for concern, and how long have these been, been going on? Remember, for the DSM criteria, a person has to have had these prior to the age of 12 is when these symptoms are supposed to have started. So if I were to talk to an adolescent or a young adult, normally what I would find is that when they were smaller in school, they were having some problems in school, learning-wise, attention-wise, and perhaps getting along with kids, maybe getting in trouble, not all the time, but for some kids that's the case. So those are all the things that I'm going to be looking for and that you should be considering if you think that you or a child might have attention deficit disorder. And of course, that's what psychologists 
uh, help out with is to kind of help tease that out and figure that out for you. Okay. Now there's been a lot of research that has been done over the years that shows that this is a, is a true condition, attention deficit disorder. And I'm by no means a, a neuroscientist, don't claim to be one, don't play one on TV. But let me point out a couple of things about the biological bases of, um, of attention deficit disorder. A few years ago, there were a couple of scientists in England who were doing some really interesting research on DNA. And they found that kids' children with ADHD um, were more likely to have specific segments of their DNA missing than other kids which causes their brains to develop differently and to develop more slowly, which is obviously going to create problems for them if you think about that. If their brains are, are maturing slower than other kids, then how could they expect to be doing the same types of things in math, in social studies, in reading, compared to their peers if they're not maturing as, as, as quickly? You see what I'm saying there? So this kind of places them uh, at a disadvantage in, in that way. Heritability is also an issue here. With kids, um, kids with ADHD are much more likely to have one parent who had attention deficit disorder themselves when they were younger. In about 25 to 30 percent of the cases, one of the parents will have had this when they were younger, whether they're aware of it or not. Like I said before, we have a lot of people that are coming in to be diagnosed for this. They had no clue until they were in their 40s, 50s, even 60s, okay? So sometimes they don't know that. Uh, if you look at twin studies, the same sort of thing, where a child who has uh, with an identical twin who has attention deficit disorder, there's three out of four chance that they will develop attention deficit disorder as well. So there's a close <coughs> genetic correspondence there. If you look at MRI scans, they've consistently associated attention deficit disorder with, uh, with less thickness of gray matter in the brain. If you look at the brain, I'm not sure if you've ever looked at a brain before. The brain uh, is, is uh, inside the, the skull. On the outside of the brain is this, this matter, it's called the cerebral cortex. And if you ever looked at it, it kind of looks like a cauliflower. If you ever sliced a cauliflower in half, it actually looks like a brain. Okay, so this is what I'm talking about with the cerebral cortex, especially in the front area of the brain. That's the part of the brain that's responsible for the most complex things we do. Things like problem solving, things like decision making, <coughs> attention control of behavior, all these things are developed uh, it, or, or, or controlled by the front part of the brain and it's really interesting. If you look at brain development, the frontal cortex is actually the last part of the brain to be developed. We start developing our brains uh, pre-birth uh, in the back, in the back and then slowly by the time we get to about oh, 25 years old, everything is fully developed. It takes 25 years for this to happen. And the frontal cortex is the last part to be developed. So if you think about this, if you think about high school kids who sometimes will do things that you kind of consider as a parent that aren't the smartest things, they might do things without thinking about it or think that they're invincible or things of this nature, oftentimes it's not because, it's because that they don't have the ability to think things through like they should, but that part of the brain hasn't been fully developed. Okay? And then PET scans is what you see here on the right in this figure up here on the, on the slide, where when you have people with ADHD perform a task, certain areas of the brain are less active for them than for people, and you can see how active <coughs> the brain is for a non-ADHD person. It's less active for a person with ADHD. So PET scans basically show us how the brain is working, okay? But here's the other thing I think is important too, and you've, you've probably heard of this before, 
having to do with something called neurotransmitters. Has anybody ever heard of that word before or know what it is? What, what is that? You know what it is? It's just basically how chemicals get around in your brain. Yeah, it's basically chemicals. There's how special they cross, chemicals. How they cross the synapses. How they cross the synapse. And, and basically that allows for communication to take place in our brain. Communication has to take place between these neurons, between these special cells, and neurotransmitters play a very special role in this. And the type of neurotransmitter will dictate the type of activity that we do, or the type of brain function that takes place, whether it's paying attention, whether it's telling us that I need to move from this place over here to this place, whatever the case is, these special chemicals do this. Now, there are two special chemicals in relation to ADHD that are called dopamine and norepinephrine that kids and adults with attention deficit disorder, they don't have enough of this. So this is what causes some of the problems that we see in this population. So when you look at things like, um, like medication like Ritalin or Adderall or or there are other ones too, the list goes on. But if you look at those medications, they will have an impact on these neurotransmitters and we'll talk about that in a little while as well, okay? So this is the evidence, primarily biological evidence for attention deficit. This is, has nothing to do with bad parenting. That's, that's a wives' tale, it's a myth that's been around for a long time. It has nothing to do with that. This is a biological disorder, okay? Okay, are there any questions so far before I move on? Any, anything you're wondering about at this point or any questions about anything that I've presented? Okay, well let's go on. So this uh, disorder has been around for a long, long time and it's been referred to in different ways over the years. Up until about, oh, about 1980, it was uh, referred to as hyperkinesis. That's, that's a fancy term. It's actually a Greek term. And when you break it down, it means above normal. That's the hyper part. And uh, motion, which is the kinesis part. So basically, above normal motion, which is what we think of as what? Hyperactivity. Okay. So in the 1980s, researchers were really starting to look at this disorder. They, they really didn't take a lot of interest in, in it until about that time. And what they found is that it wasn't just an issue with excessive motor movement. That they found that many of these kids who that they were, they were researching were having problems with attention and concentration and organization and some of these executive function skills, which we'll talk about in a second. So they looked at this and said, you know what? We need to re-examine this and perhaps uh, relabel this, okay? So what used to be called hyperkinetic reaction of childhood was renamed. In the 1980s, they started to call it attention deficit slash hyperactivity disorder. And the reason that they have the slash in there is because some of the kids that they researched had no problems with motor control at all. They weren't hyperactive. They just had a lot of problems paying attention and concentrating and organizing and all that kind of stuff. So they found that there were actually two types of attention deficit disorder. So that's why you see that slash. And that's also why you will sometimes hear this referred to as attention deficit disorder. You've probably heard that term. And other people will say attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. One has the hyperactivity component, the other does not. Okay, so that's the, the essential difference there. Okay. So we have these scientists doing all this research. They're finding that it's just not an issue with uh, motor control, that attention also plays an issue. And so what ended up happening is that as the researchers went on, they found that there were specific problems. Once again, what I was telling you about before 
in the front area of the brain that controls many of these things that we all do day in and day out. And these things, these things are what they called the um, executive functions. And so what I did up here is I put this little metaphor <coughs> of how, how you can kind of think about this, about what executive functions are. If you think about the conductor of, a, of an orchestra, you think about what he or she does. That they're up there, they're waving their baton, but they're doing more than that. They're basically pointing to different members of the orchestra, pointing them out, now it's your turn to play. It's your turn to play. Tone it down. Get louder at this point. Okay, guys, this is really where we need to kind of speed it up. They're controlling all this type of stuff. And this is essentially what executive functions do. They control different aspects of our behavior. You can also kind of think about it as the manager at a store. What does the manager at a store do? They basically make sure that everything runs efficiently, everything gets done the way it's supposed to be done, we have all of our supplies for the store, the workers are doing their work, making sure once again that everything's done the way that it's supposed to be done. So what I want to do is I want to talk a little bit <clears throat> about these executive functions. Uh, and, and I guess when you look at these, I think one of the, one of the primary things, and this doesn't really uh, come as any surprise, is that kids who have attention deficit have trouble staying tuned in to something. Have you ever traveled somewhere? <clears throat> like I went to Michigan to my father-in-law's um, <coughs> cabin last summer, way out in the middle of nowhere. And of course I have my cell phone and I'm trying to make a call and I can't make a call. And I look up, you know the little bars that show you how strong the signal is on your phone? I didn't have any bars on that. So I move, I, I go outside, I, I go about 50 yards away from the cabin, now I see a bar on there. And then I kind of move to a different part of the property, I get three bars, I go back to the cabin, I don't have any bars. So this is kind of what it's like for kids with attention deficit disorder, is that they have problems receiving signals. Because the, the signal strength, it kind of fades in and out, and so they can't really tune in well enough to receive those signals to get the information that they, that they need. Capturing those signals is very difficult and it's extremely frustrating for them. And it is for parents and teachers too. Why is it that you can pay attention sometimes, but other times you can't? It's very frustrating that there's that lack of consistency and people don't seem to understand this, this aspect of kids. With, also with ADHD kids, they're distracted. And most of us, I think, you know, in this room, we could probably say we're able to kind of more or less stay zeroed in on things. If we had something, some tasks, some activity that we had to do, for the most part, we could kind of stay on that and get it done through to completion. But that's not necessarily the case for kids with ADHD. The issue with them is that there are too many things that are distracting. So think of this little metaphor. Kind of think about how in your house you have screens on your windows or on your door. What are the screens for? Why, why do we have screens on windows or doors? Keep bugs out. Keep bugs out. Yeah, that's typically. And there's some other reasons, but that's the main reason. Okay. So if you kind of think about this for the ADHD child, the problem for them is that they have too many holes in their mental screen. They can't filter out the bugs. For them, what the bugs are, are if they're sitting in the classroom, somebody's walking down the hallway. And what is the kid doing? They're not doing their work like they're supposed to be doing. They're kind of looking out to see who's walking down the hallway, right? They hear people behind them talking. They can't do their work, so what do they do? They turn around to see what they're saying, maybe even joining in on the conversation because they can't filter out those types of things. So this is very typical of what we see. Now here's, here's the thing, and I was just referring to this a second ago. Kids with ADHD don't have problems paying attention in all situations. 
And I've always had parents, never fails to amaze me, I've always had parents who have told me, my child can pay attention for hours when, and you guys can probably fill in the blank, they're playing video games or you know they're they're out with their buddies they're doing things that they really love to do that's not the issue you remember when i was talking about before that the issue is when they're doing what something boring and monotonous remember that that that's when the issue really seems to come uh in play so that's that's the problem here that they can pay attention if it's something that they're really interested in otherwise they can't so i think for us people who don't have attention deficit, we can all make ourselves pay attention. I mean, if we really have to, we can make ourselves do this. Not the case for ADHD kids. Because of the way that their brains are wired. Not the same as non-ADHD people. They can't focus for long periods of, of time. It's not a question of willpower. It's, it's not that at all. Their brains will not allow them to focus for long periods of time. So this is what they're contending with. So it's, it's really um, this issue of what we were talking about before. When I was talking about the evidence, the biological evidence, you remember when I was talking about um, the, the dopamine and the norepinephrine, those special chemicals? They don't have enough of this, so it doesn't allow for enough communication to take place. And when communication doesn't take place, you can't do the things that your brain is really designed to do. The things that you and I probably take for granted day in and day out, okay? So, two situations, and these are two exceptions to the rule. The two situations in which kids can focus better are if the activity is really interesting to them, which is what we talked about already, and the second one, which we haven't talked about, which is if the situation is an urgent one. So if they have to respond right here, right now, almost as if a person is holding a gun to their head, that they have to do this, the pressure is on, then they can perform, the last minute sort of thing. And it drives parents nuts because they cannot stand it when their kids, what, procrastinate? Okay, so, so urgency, this urgency is the outcome of procrastination. They have to perform, they have to do this. So this is what's going on here. So that's when they can perform. Another one of these executive functions that you may have seen is difficulty with organi organization and getting started on things, okay? So parents and teachers might notice, if you looked in a child's desk, or if you looked in their backpack, what would you see? Probably a disaster zone. That's probably what you would see. With some kids, you would see that. Not all kids with ADHD, though. Actually, there are some kids with ADHD that are meticulous that are really well organized, and that's not really the problem for them. It's that they have a problem with something else, and that problem is organizing time and work. That's where they show the problem, okay? So, so like, they might have trouble fi figuring out how much time it's going to take to complete a class project. Think about that. There's a lot of planning that goes into that. If it's a big class project, like over the course of a nine week mark, marking period, that they have to do this project for this unit, whatever it is, they have all this time. And for, for kids, they have to learn how to plan out their time. And as they get older, they get better at this. But you remember how we said with kids with ADHD, their brains mature slower? And so that's a really difficult thing for them to do. So that's where parents come into play and teachers come into play by helping them kind of plan out these things. Hey, Jason, have you started on that project, that science project that you were supposed to be doing? What do you think that you should be doing first? Let, let's, let's kind of come up with a game plan here and figure out what you need to do, how long this is going to take you, and kind of plan it out that way. 
So kids will need that kind of help from their parents to figure out those, those types of things. But even getting started on tasks can be a problem too, the procrastination issue that I was talking about earlier. Also, kids may have difficulty uh, just showing effort in finishing tasks. So it's interesting because we were just talking about getting started on tasks, organizing, that kind of stuff. For some kids, no problem at all. But when it comes time to actually finish the task, to show, the, to demonstrate the mental effort that's involved to actually follow through and, and complete that task, that's an issue. And for some kids, it's almost as if they run out of um, attention, attentional gas. You know, they just kind of run, they're pooped. They don't have anything more to give. Marilyn. These children frequently uh, experience mental fatigue. Yes. It, it takes their brain twice as much energy to, to accomplish the things for those of us that do not have an attention disorder. And just to kind of, if you don't mind me yeah. stepping in, um, another thing that, like, let's just say that you give a, a kid that's got an attention disorder a sheet like this, and it's, it's homework, and it's problems. And they look at it, and they get totally overwhelmed by the numbers of items on the page. And one of the interventions that you can do is to take a sheet of paper and cover up the bottom part and say, okay, break it into smaller steps. We're gonna do this first, okay? And then oftentimes these children uh, and it's individual, and I, I, I'm sorry if I get a little off here. This is just some intervention. Yeah. Um, some children, like in school, they are exhausted from, from school I am. But some children need to come home, and you have to figure this out, and they need to start right away on their homework. Some children need a break. But you've got to they will get those breaks going forever. You've got to establish a time. You, you have 30 minutes to do what you want to do mm -hmm. and use timers. Because they will argue with you. Oh, it's, I'll, I'll do it, I'll be there in a minute. I'll do it in a minute. I'll get there, especially with the video game. Okay? And then that's the big fight that starts. And another thing is sometimes give them, a, you know, <coughs> break their work down into small pieces, and then give them 10 minutes off because of the mental fatigue. Right. And the other thing, and I'll be quiet, because <laughs> this was a big mistake. My son's room was always like a total disaster. So, and here was a mistake that I, it's time for you to go clean up your room. I would just say go clean up your room. Sure. Mm -hmm. Too much information. Break it in. I need you to go pick up your clothes and put them in the clothes basket. Mm -hmm. One thing. Check on that. Then go in and break it in because they get overwhelmed. And that's when the fight starts. And you know how that is. And then there's the crying at the homework. We won't talk about that right now. Exactly. So really, yeah, so what you're saying is that they get overwhelmed with complexity. When things are, when there's too much that they have to deal with, especially at one time, that they feel overwhelmed. And actually, we're going to talk about feelings in a minute, emotions in a minute. But one thing I wanted to add to what Marilyn said, that one thing I used to have parents do uh, when the kid said, I'll be there in a minute, I'll be there in a minute when they're playing a video game or whatever, I would tell the parents, well, I'll tell you what, for each minute they take late getting back to you, you subtract that from the time that they're allowed to play the video game the next day. So that's that's a good way of dealing with that. So, which doesn't go over too well with the kids, you can imagine. Okay. okay, so let's talk about this since we're kind of on this topic. This is this is a good way to, good time to talk about feelings. 
because I think when you talk about a lot of these executive functions, planning, attention, all this kind of stuff, where is the emotional component in all of this? Because there certainly is one. And th it's interesting that this has become a bigger topic in this area of ADHD research over the past five years, where they started to look much closer at the emotional aspect of, of these kids. So let's say that, it, that kids in a classroom, they've been given 10 minutes to complete uh, um, uh, 10, 10 math problems, uh, and then they, you know, that, that class is done. And so the kid starts, everybody starts, and the kid with the ADHD, you remember that mental screen the bugs go through? They hear some kids whispering behind them, and then they hear somebody crumpling paper, and then they see somebody walking up to the front of the classroom and coming back, and all this stuff is going on, and then they hear somebody behind them talk again. And so they turn around and say, stop being so noisy, I can't get this done, because they're feeling stressed out because eight minutes have passed and they're still on the first problem, okay? And of course, then they have to take it home and then parents have to deal with this. So, but it's so frustrating to these kids that they have to, have to deal with this, this kind of stuff. So, so it's, it kind of goes on where you're having to deal with this, you're kind of having to teach the kids how to regulate their emotions, okay? To, to kind of deal with this. Of course, as a parent, you have to regulate your own emotions, too, to kind of get through this. Okay, another problem is something called working memory. Now, this is memory that we kind of, kind of just store temporarily. It's not long-term memory. It's nothing like that. Basically, working memory has to do with these things that we want to remember for a short period of time to accomplish a task. So if I tell a kid, um, you know... Um, I want you to go brush your teeth when you're in the next minute. So that's one thing, kind of like what Marilyn was saying, just give them one thing to remember to do. And that's fairly easy for the child to remember. But if you were to tell the child, I want you to brush your teeth, then I want you to finish your homework, and I want you to shut off the computer and go to bed. Okay, so chances are they're gonna remember two, maybe only one of those things, because they don't have good working memories. Now, if I were to ask the child, tell me what you did on your vacation last summer, they could probably go into elaborate detail of everything that they did. Why? That's fun stuff. I love that stuff. That's interesting stuff, right? They can remember that stuff. It's the short-term working memory that tends to be the issue for them, okay? So in the classroom, if they have something that they really want to share, it's, it's right up here, and they really want to talk about this. And the teacher says, now, just wait a minute. We have to wait for these other kids to share their stuff first. And so they kind of go around the room, and it finally gets down to, to this kid. And the teacher says, well, what did you want to say, Johnny? Uh, I forgot. Okay, so that's the issue. So the difficulty of keeping this thing uh, in, in memory. Some other issues are slowing down or speeding up. Slowing down when they need to slow down, speeding up when they need to speed up. How many of you have kids that when they do their homework, they rush through it and just want to get it over with? Okay, that's just that characteristic of attention deficit disorder kids, by the way. Any, any kid will, will do that kind of stuff because they have better things to do with their time. But with these kids, that tends to be a problem on a more frequent basis, and they have trouble slowing themselves down. It's the same thing I was just talking about a minute ago, where you had the kid who's in the classroom who walks around, who wants to sharpen his pencil, throw away something, just kind of work off that, that excess energy. And so that's the issue here. But it, that's not always the issue. Sometimes the, the problem is failing to speed up, to do things that they need to do to get something done. It's almost as if they take their foot off their mental accelerator or maybe they didn't even push it down to begin with. And so they're in slow motion. So in the classroom, what you might see is that the kid is taking a long time to get stuff done, maybe even the last one done, all the time, when they're supposed to be doing tests or their, or their school work. Okay, a couple more things, and then we'll talk about how is this actually diagnosed. Monitoring actions is the last thing I want to say about this. 
A child with attention deficit might have trouble waiting his turn. Blurt out the first thing that comes to mind, whether and, and get, and not even really be, be aware or be concerned about the, the consequences. Might get reprimanded by the teacher. None of the kids want to play with them on the playground that day because they said something that's upsetting or something that kind of makes them look weird or unusual, which is something that the social aspect of this is what some of these kids are, are dealing with. Okay, So they may be totally clueless about how they're coming off. So in terms of uh, how this is actually diagnosed, there's not one test that will tell you, yes, this person has it. No, they don't. Usually psychologists will look at a whole bunch of different things. So some of the things that they'll take into consideration are our history. So if I had a parent and a child come in to see me for an ADHD evaluation, I'm going to talk to both of them and basically this is how it goes. What brought you in here today? How long has this been going on? How, how has this been affecting you? So we'll be getting kind of a, a lowdown on what the, is, the primary issues are. We'll look at relationships among family. We'll look at relationships socially. We'll look at how well they're doing in school. We'll look at their emotional status. We'll look at any other type of thing that might help me understand this child better. Once they're done with the interview, they take a series of psychological tests. And, even, and as part of that testing process, I'm going to be able to observe them. So if I give them an intelligence test, which uh, we always start off with very easy questions and they always get really kind of difficult, I want to find out a couple of things about them. Are they going to stick with it when they have to do something challenging or something that takes a lot of mental effort? Will, this, will they stick with that task? Do they listen to directions? Does it seem as though they're moving around all the time? Like back in Green Bay, I had one child that I tested that had to move around so much they actually climbed on top of my file cabinet. And I tested them from there. I could ask them questions and they responded. They just had to move around, okay, which is fine. But I also rely on teachers. I used to go into classrooms and do classroom observations. Don't have time to do that now. So I rely on teachers. And I have them fill out a form. It kind of looks like this. And one of the things I say is, Kind of just jot down three things that you've observed about this child recently that are of concern to you. So at least I get the teacher's perspective on what they're seeing in the classroom. Because for a diagnosis of ADHD, it has to occur at least two different places, two different environments. Home and school is what that amounts to for a kid. A home and work is what that might amount to for an adult. So I want to get that input. Of course, there are a series of psychological tests that are given. Teachers fill out some rating forms. Parents fill out rating forms. Some of the rating forms give me a whole host of information, not only about attention problems, but about depression, anxiety, conduct problems, aggression, and then some tests that are specific to attention deficit disorder, and then a little computer game that they play to find out how well they can pay attention and concentrate. And this is really good at getting at those executive function issues that I was talking about a few minutes ago. Once that is done, I would score the test, I would interpret those findings, and then look at whether or not the child actually displays all of these characteristics that we're talking about, that you looked at in that handout, the very first handout that you looked at, the DSM-5, those symptoms, do they have those? The bell-shaped curve, do they fall to one of the extremes based on the test results? Does it seem that this is the only problem that they have, or do they have some other problems too? It's very possible that a child could have attention deficit and some other problems like anxiety or depression. That's a possibility. So that's what a psychological evaluation is designed to do, is to help figure that out. And does the evidence, the history, the observations, the test results, do all those things point to attention deficit disorder? And that's what we're trying to do with making the diagnosis. Now in terms of how you treat this, medication is usually the, the way that most people will go. It's not always necessary. In many cases it is. And I'll talk about stimulant 
and non-stimulant medication in a second. But the other way that this is dealt with is through old standard behavior modification. So rewarding uh, uh, positive behavior and punishing, and punishing is sort of like time out, that kind of thing, for the negative behavior. So here are some just real basics about behavior modification, about setting daily goals for the child or for the adult. For the child, it might be brushing their teeth in the morning without having to be reminded, or at least not having to be reminded 10 times to do this. Maybe that that's what the daily goal is for them. Okay? Establishing and consistently enforcing clear rules. Put the toilet seat down after you're done using it. And if they don't put it down, then we would do corrective practice. When my son was little, Marilyn remembers who my son was, he would throw temper tantrums and he would slam his door. And whenever he did that, I would go up to his room and said, Luke, let's try this again. Open the door and close it gently. Do it again, do it again. I'd have him do it five times and he was so pissed at me. <laughs> but you know what? He, he learned, and so when he got upset in the future, he didn't do that as often, okay? Put the toilet seat down five times. Okay, it's that sort of, same sort of thing. Give clear directives, okay? So give clear and appropriate commands or directives. Um, I could tell the child, okay, clean up for dinner. That's not very clear. That's kind of vague. But if I say to the child, wash your hands and be at the table in two minutes, that's very clear, that's very specific. And we could do the same thing with that, that every minute that they're late for dinner, we take off the time from video games the following day, or that night, okay, whatever you wanna do. Praising is very important. I can't tell you how important this is. What the research shows is that praise is just as important as tangible rewards for kids. So please use that. Be very free in your use of praising the child. Thank you so much for taking out the garbage tonight. Or, you know, you did such a good job on your homework tonight. I noticed that you didn't give up. Good job. You know, just those very simple, basic things will go a long way. Now, you can use rewards if you want. It doesn't have to be something that you buy a child. Privileges work really well. Allowing the child to stay up 15 minutes later before bedtime. Allowing the child 15 more minutes of video game. You know, and, you, and the list goes on. Actually, I think I have some ideas in that, that handout that I gave you um, that shows you other things that you can do. Non-physical punishments are very good as well, so try to opt for timeouts. There may be times that you need to spank your child, and everybody has different values about that and different opinions about that. We didn't spank our kids very often. There were some times that we needed to, we felt, but that was just us. But um, things like timeout can be very effective if it's used appropriately. And I'll tell you what the problem is with timeout, where it usually <coughs> fails. If it's a two-parent home, one of the issues is there's lack of agreement between the parents about the use of timeout or how to use it. That's one of the issues. In a two-parent or a one-parent, single-parent home, the other issue that comes up is consistency in the use of proper timeout. Okay? So these are the two things. But the, the, the system that I like, and Marilyn may know about the 123 Magic system, it's been around for years, very good system. It's a counting system that works very well uh, with kids, with kids who argue, who badger, who you know, display a lot of different behavioral problems. And there could be a daily report card. Now, this is, this is a thing that you could use if your child is having some problems at school. There are two handouts that I gave you. Uh, it's called a Homeschool Behavior Modification Program. One set of directions is for parents. One is for teachers. It's actually, it's probably about four or five pages. It seems like it's a big thing to do. It's actually very easy to do. You have the, you have the teacher give the kid two ratings every day, one for their morning behavior, one for their afternoon behavior, based on whatever goal that you want the child to achieve, whatever you want them to improve, better attention span, stay in your seat. 
These ratings are sent home with the child to show to the parent every day. The parent looks at how many points that the kid earned. The number of points will determine the level of privileges that evening, that, that night. If the kid gets more points, the kid gets more privileges. If they get fewer points, fewer privileges. No points, no privileges. So it's kind of based this way, but it's, it's explained pretty well in, in those handouts that you have there. Okay, last thing I want to talk, talk about, and I apologize for going longer than I, than I intended to, is medication. So for attention deficit disorder, this is the treatment of choice in the majority of cases. Because remember how we were talking before about how kids and adults with uh, attention deficit disorder either aren't producing enough uh, dopamine or norepinephrine. And so what these medications do, they basically do the same type of thing, is they force uh, anything that is produced, they will help the production of these neurotransmitters, they will force them out into what Ray Allen was talking about before, the synapse, which is this little gap between the neurons, and find a place to dock, find a place to become effective. And they force these neurons, many, many of these, these chemicals, these neurotransmitters, to stay out there to have, uh, have uh, effectiveness in terms of these executive functions. Paying attention better, better impulse control, settle down so I can do my work, whether it's in the workplace or at school. That's what the medications do. They work in about eight out of 10 cases. So for 80% of the kids, they'll work. Sometimes kids will not respond very well to these. Sometimes they'll have side effects. Headaches and stomach aches are typical for many kids for about the first week. Those will usually go away. The side effects that usually persist for about 25 to 30% of the kids are decreased appetite. They don't want to eat as much when the medication is in their system. When it wears off toward the end of the day, they might feel ravenous. For other kids, they might have problems falling asleep at night. So it's a stimulant, after all. So those are the primary things that happens in about 30% of the cases, too. There are non-stimulants that are available for people who either can't tolerate stimulants or the doctor's preference. Sometimes doctors just prefer using a different type of medication to treat attention deficit disorder. But they have the same impact. Non-stimulants like Stratera, have uh, a bigger impact on norepinephrine uh, than it does dopamine, but it's the, the impact is the same, okay? They're not quite as, well, I shouldn't say the impact is the same. They're not quite as potent as the stimulants are, but they do enough for most people to make a difference, okay? Okay, do you have any questions at all about any of this stuff? I know I went over a lot of stuff, and I know I went over it quickly toward the end. But any questions about any of this at all? Yeah. Do you notice if a child uh, is diagnosed at a young age and they begin medicine, does that medicine build up to where they have to have a stronger uh, milligram of it? They kind of develop a tolerance yeah. for it. Yeah, that happens in many kids. So what ends up happening is that they go to the doctor and the parent says, you know, this doesn't seem to be working as well as it did. The doctor will do two, one of two things. They'll either increase the dosage level, and if that doesn't work, then they'll usually switch to a different, a different stimulant or a non-stimulant, like we were talking about before. Yeah. But that, yeah, that happens in a lot of kids, as well as adults. Who else has a question? Marilyn? I would just like to make a comment because I think sometimes we get really frustrated with our children who have, I like to say they have unique brains, okay, instead of some of the negative uh, labels to this sort of thing. And um, there are many very famous people that um, have attention disorder, and I was trying to pull it up, but we, the internet was down. But uh, we could, uh, Goldberg, Dr. Uh, President George Bush had it. A number of our presidents have had it. Um, uh, uh, Justin Timberlake, uh, Einstein with ADHD. Einstein did not read until he was 12 years old. Dr. Hallowell that we were talking about mm -hmm. uh, had also had, uh, he was 
dyslexic. He could not read until he was about uh, 15 years old, and he was also ADD. He graduated from Harvard University, went to Tulane uh, College. Then when it was he was in college is when he discovered when he was doing his psychiatric rotation and studying, he diagnosed himself. And he is a world-renowned child psychiatrist. And I, w I love one of the descriptions that he tells kids that particularly have the ADHD. He said, your brain is like a Ferrari, the motor of a Ferrari. Uh -huh. He said, your engine is big and it runs wild, but you have bicycle brakes. Yes. Now, that's <laughs> my son. <laughs> children are challenging, but we need to focus on their unique quality that we see. And parenting them is very challenging, and it's not easy. Uh, and when you have those tough times, find that friend that you can talk to, that you feel safe, and you know, that when you have that mama feeling or daddy feeling like I'm just the worst thing in the world. Uh, Call that person up and, you know, that, that understands your child. But you have very unique children, and uh, the gifts that you have given them are gifts to our world. And so, you know, it's not all bad. No, it's not all bad. But all. none of us have an easy road to growing up. You know, we've all had struggles. Struggles. But thank you so much for what you um, um, you know presented to us. Is there anyone else that has a question or? Um, I, and I know we've gone over time. If anybody, I'm willing to stay after if anybody wants to leave. But I'm willing to stay here to answer some questions. I just want to make uh, you aware of there is a Facebook group, the Murfreesboro ADD and ADHD Facebook community, where we discuss <coughs> issues like this. So I encourage you to join that if you have not yet. Um, also, if you have any questions about perhaps having your child evaluated for attention deficit, I can talk to you about that as well. So, I really appreciate you coming here tonight, and um, thanks. We are so excited about that.